good morning. I was uh, so glad to be here this morning. We want to welcome you those who are here and those who are watching online this morning. I want to start with scripture this morning from Psalm 40. And David expresses kind of his confidence in God's will here. In verse, said, it's a, verse 7 it says, Then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your love is within my heart. And I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. And I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Verse 11, as for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. And what we see here is Daniel's obedience and God's will and how he declares boldly God's character and action. Well, let's stand this morning as we worship and as we declare his steadfast love and mercy.
Melissa Colbert, and I'm a teacher in Jefferson County, and this morning I'm going to be praying for the needs of our community, our students, and our families, our teachers, as we are preparing to head back to school. Would you pray with me? Dear Father God, you are the creator of all. You are perfect in all your ways. Lord, you bring peace and clarity to all who keep their focus on you. Your plans, purpose, and timing are flawless, and all for your glory. Thank you, Father, for your provisions and for the protection that you've given to our students and our families during this pandemic. As Jefferson County prepares in the weeks ahead to reopen the schools, Lord, please give wisdom to those making decisions for what that looks like. 
We pray, Lord, that you would orchestrate all that needs to happen in order for our elementary, middle, and high school students to safely return. Please bring peace and comfort where there is fear and anxiety. We ask that you bless our teachers, bus drivers, custodians, the support staff, counselors, administrators, students, and their families. Help us, Father, to give grace to one another as we adjust to a return after being away for so long. Remind us that we are all created in your image and teach us, Lord, to love one another deeply. Remind those working with our students, Lord, that they cannot meet all the needs they encounter, but that you can according to your glorious riches. Thank you for equipping those you have called into our schools with exactly what is needed to do the work you have prepared for them. Lord, where there is success, may we give you all the praise, glory, and honor. May our only boast be in you. For those students and staff members who do not know you as their Lord and Savior, we pray for them. Please place people in their lives who will speak truth and point them to you. We love you, Jesus, and it is in your beautiful, mighty, and precious name that we pray. Amen. Morning, church. My name is Eric Velker. I'm the, the new youth pastor here at, Do uh, at uh, Cornerstone. I just wanted to say I know that I'm not quite as good looking as Matt, um, but I appreciate the opportunity. I'm humbled uh, to be able to get to, to be with you all this morning, both online as well as uh, in person, even though the weather's trying to, to keep us away. Um, if you have your Bibles, if you will please go ahead and open up to the book of Genesis. Uh, we are going to continue our study um, looking at what has happened with the fall and then what is moving on to uh, as the first nucleus, the first family is being um, brought into the scene. A little something about me before we get started, though. Um, in addition to being a youth pastor for, for about 10 years or so, I also have had the, uh, the privilege of being an English teacher um, a little bit everywhere, whether it be JCPS here, which I'm now, um, in Florida, private schools. Um, and so with that said, um, being an English teacher, words have a little bit of, maybe a little bit too much of a special meaning to me, if that makes any sense. I mean, as, as an English teacher, you know, as I'm leading my students, as I'm trying to teach them to read closely and to, and to get further into what literature or what the text has to say, um, words kind of stand out, and, and, and I kind of feel like a, a detective, you know, kind of going underneath, behind the scenes a little bit. But there's a, there's a word that I'd like to share with you today that's what we're going to be talking about. Today's message is called Lifting the Curse. So I wanted to talk to you guys about a curse. What does a curse mean? And how do we see it play out, especially in Genesis 4? So what we see is that the word curse is a solemn utterance intended to invoke a supernatural power to inflict harm or punishment on someone or something. One of the things that in that definition I want to kind of bring out, though, is that it's intended to invoke a supernatural power. So someone who has a, you know, so if a curse is being used, it's not usually in the power or authority of the person. It's in a, a higher power. And so with that said, we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about the first curse that was ever brought on to humanity and then what that looks like for the first family. Because movies, literature, as you guys know, Harry Potter and all these different things, you know, curses are seen in very different ways. I was, in, in pre preparing for this, I was even looking at something that said that there's there was a book, The 900 Ways to Break a Curse, and something like that. And I may not, you know, I don't know exactly where you fall on, on your lines of, of believing in curses or knowing about curses, etc. But curses are very real, especially when, when God has to, when God gives one. So if you will look with this to, uh, excuse me, if you'll look with me at this, last week we preached on, on looking at the first family and how they were perfect, they had purity, they had joy, they had peace, but then they were deceived and they sinned and they ate of the fruit and something was broken and then we have a relationship. So I want to, I want to look briefly at that scene real quick because I think there's a part of it, before God even speaks, I think there's a part that, that, that's going to play directly into this next chapter that we're going to look at. So if you look at me, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 7, and it says, 
Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Now you might be asking me, Eric, that is a very odd passage for you to ever preach before a cornerstone to look at their nakedness. And I get it. You know, that, it's uncomfortable. But especially for them, right? And I want you to see, like, the curse took effect before God even spoke. See, they had just eaten of the fruit. They had just been deceived. And Adam was right there along the whole time. And what happened was that their eyes were opened and they saw that they were naked. What does that look like? What does that mean? Well, what we see is we see guilt. We see shame. But more importantly, an overwhelming sense of loss in identity. You get that? They were perfect. They were able to live their lives without any, any stumbling block. They had a perfect marriage. They had a perfect everything. And especially a perfect relationship with God in which their identity came from. See, they were complete. They were never lacking. They were never feeling like, I need to name five more animals for me to feel successful today. Right? They were satisfied. Which is something that we all pursue at some point, right? You see celebrities, you see different people, and, and there's this hungry all the time. They can never be filled. And see, the struggle is, is that that curse that came on Adam and Eve is also the same one that all of us have to struggle with. Even after salvation, us in our sinful flesh will always struggle with that curse to a degree. So if we look further, we're going to read a little bit further into this because what we see here is our first point that we have is that our sinful nature leads us farther from lifting this curse. Remember, I talked about this whole message today is going to be about lifting the curse. Because from the get-go, humanity has struggled and wanted to take away what they have done. You see, after they saw that they were naked, what did it say that they did? They knit leaves together, right? They made loin clothes. Loin clothes? They made underwear, right? They covered themselves. But was that enough? Did that make them feel whole again? Now that they feel incomplete, they feel guilty, they feel shame, they covered it with just some leaves that they had. See, in chapter 4 is that, and what we're going to see throughout the rest of history is that man is going to have a struggle to always try to lift the curse themselves. Instantaneously, Adam and Eve, who were perfectly flawless with everything they did, they followed the Lord's will, his commands, they obeyed, and then all of a sudden, their natural instinct is to cover themselves, which was very unnatural. Our sinful nature leads us farther from lifting the curse. And what is left is an insatiable desire to get that burden off. So let's, open, let's look in chapter 4 as we get going this morning into our text. Because we're going to be introduced to Cain and Abel. So the first five verses, if you're reading with me, please. They'll be on the screen. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife. And she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of the fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. So as we unpack this, I want to kind of start backwards and then go to the beginning in this, in this chapter here. Because what I want to see is, why was Cain so angry? Why did his face, his countenance, if you will, why did his demeanor, who he was, fall? You might be asking me, like, and I know it's hard for us to identify with Cain, because we know the story, right? We know what Cain's about to do. You don't have to be going to church a long time to hear what Cain does. But I want you to see a little bit of the behind scenes of what Cain is dealing with here. And uh, maybe kind of understand why he's so angry. And why he's really lost something of who he's tried to build himself. So if you look back in that verse 1 right there, we see that Adam and Eve, right, they conceived and bore a son. And they said, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Now, you might be asking, why is that quote there, right? 
Why is Eve saying that I have gotten, which actually is what Cain's name means, I have gotten a man from the Lord, right, with his help? You kind of almost hear a little optimism, right? Like, yes. Well, if you remember, you back up just a little bit, chapter 3, verse 15, God's first curse that he he puts on the serpent. And this curse says that I will put in between, between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What does that mean? Your offspring, someone in your family, is going to crush the head of the serpent. There's going to be retribution. There's going to be deliverance. You will not have to, for eternity, dwell in the sense that you are broken and that you have failed. So you can just imagine, Eve finally gives birth to a male. This is it, right? I have finally given birth to a son who's going to lift this curse and finally undo what I've done. Now, you can imagine, some of you, many of you on, at home and different things, you have kids, right? One of, the, one of the trademarks that we see from parents is that we try to impute our desires, impute our, our wants onto them, right? You see them, they like, they actually shoot that basketball on that little bitty goal or something like that, and you're like, they make it somehow, and you're like, oh my gosh, future star. So then you're like scheduling like practice times for them when they're two, you know, all right, every day you got to have five more jumpers. So what we do is we try to, we try to put that on our kids sometimes, right? And you can only imagine what Cain is, the pressure that he's under, right? You are the Messiah, right? You are the one who's going to deliver us from our problems that we have made. You can break and lift this curse. You can only imagine what kind of psychologically that would do to that that child. And what do we see? Is Cain this evil person that we see? Look at verse 2 in chapter 4. And again she bore Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. All right, so we see he's a worker of the ground. Adam was also assigned the job of being the worker of the ground, right? Keep the garden, right? To govern over it. What we see is that he is given as firstborn, he's given that priority, that this is the most responsible job that you can have. This is just like your father. You're going to be the better father. You're not going to allow us to sin more. You kind of see this rolling. You see this rolling. The next thing we see in verse 3 is that, that there's offerings being made. Cain's not out there like sulking and just being like this this evil man that we see from man's eyes. What we see is that Cain is, he's actually producing vegetables, ground from the plants, and he's actually giving it as an offering to the Lord. But then there's a turn. And then what do we see at the end of that, verse 4 and 5? Is that the Lord takes regard for Abel's offering, but for Cain... He has no regard. You can just imagine what's going through his mind. All practicality, he thought he was going to be the one. We see that he's just angry and betrayed. Why? You can only imagine his thoughts. How, God, how could you do this to me? I've done everything right. I've worked. I've toiled. I've sacrificed. I'm supposed to be delighted in, right? You're supposed to like me. Obviously, I am the one that you've chosen, I have to restore favor and undo what my parents have done. And you honor him? My younger brother? Why? Why would you do this to me? But see, what we really see, what we can identify here in the 21st century, is that Cain was merely practicing religion. Hear me, church. Cain was just following, yes, uh, being obedient, doing the things that he was supposed to do. But he was trying to do it for himself. He was trying to be strong enough to do it for himself. He was trying to lift the curse. And the sad thing is, is that we kind of struggle with this today a little bit too, if we're honest. Some of us in this room are trying to, to lift the curse yourselves. You grew up in a church home, you were taught to tithe maybe, to maybe even serve, but the person behind who we worship, who we should aim to please, who we should delight in, maybe not as centered on the heart of Christ, but 
but about making ourselves feel better. Maybe your parents have said, we'll be proud of you, or a a kid should grow up this way. A Christian should be like this. So our goal is to just check those boxes off to make ourselves feel like we're accomplished. I am a good Christian, right, by what I do. See, some of us have always lived this way. And at home, and when we go home after church, there still might be that empty feeling. I'm not quite all the way there. I'm not quite accomplished. Some of us may have been saved and transformed and, and rejuvenated in Christ, but then after a while, we've kind of started going through the motions, right? We lost track of why we do what we do and who we do it for. And instead, we're just on autoplay. I go there, I serve, I give. And we kind of feel like this burden is put on us to just continue to keep doing and keep the status quo, if you will. Just so that we can feel better or at least feel okay enough. And I get it, especially in the pandemic. It, it feels good to be normal a little bit, right? It feels good to kind of have a rhythm and a routine because that was taken away from us for a while. But if we forget the who, if we get why, we are saved and, and, and set apart to do these things. Do we kind of start lifting the curse ourselves? We try to start lifting the curse ourselves. So if we read Hebrews 11, 4 through 6, it says, By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice to Cain, through which he was commended as righteousness. Look at those first two words, by faith. God commending him by accepting his gifts and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. I want you to see this. By faith, what does that mean? With the right heart set, with the right trust being placed on God, with that relationship of knowing that it's for a person. It's for this one whom he lives for. His offering was accepted. His offering was pleasing. See, I think that's the, that, that is the biggest difference between Cain and Abel. They both did the same thing, right? They're offering. And some people might say, well, well yeah, Abel was, he was giving a sacrifice, and it was a blood sacrifice, right? That's, that's more appropriate than grain. In Leviticus, we read that, that a grain offering was, was acceptable as well in act of worship. Actually, it's called a, a, a mincha. And a mincha was meant to, to provide a, a special blessing for a king in thanksgiving, for what they have done for their understudies, for what they have done for their people. So a grain offering was actually a a sense of honor, like I'm giving this in thank you, saying that I couldn't be who I am today without you. But think about that. Cain's offering, intended to give exalt to a king, was missing the who the offering was for. And it it was Abel's faith that made what he did acceptable. Both offerings were fine, but it was his faith. And see what we see here as we get back to to chapter 4 is that only through conviction and repentance can someone see that they're not the one to lift the curse and that the curse can actually be lifted. So look at, if you'll go back to chapter 4 with me, and read in verse 6 through 7. Here's what we see. It says, The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why is your face fallen? Verse 7. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, how or sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Pause for a second. You might be looking at me and be like, Eric, I don't really understand that passage. Why would God say, that you should just do better, do well. Does it sound like work-based to you, to you? Like, maybe, Cain, if you showed up 15 minutes earlier, I would have accepted your, your offering. Now, again, that's not accurate, by the way. As an English teacher, I want to kind of break this down a little bit. You know, because sometimes when you're teaching, right, you got, you got the kids in there, and you're like, all right, guys, let's learn about verbs today. They're like, oh, come on, Mr. V, why are we learning about verbs, Right? Well, today we're going to use a lesson of English. And I'm going to kind of try to just really show and unlock what God is really saying to Cain. So follow with me just a second. Let's, let's go back and unpack that chapter 4, verse, verse 7 right there. 
Here's what he says. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at, is crouching at the door. Its desire is to rule over you. Now what we see here, if you do well, that's the one that trips us up. Well right there is an adverb. And well answers the question, how? So God is not saying what you need to do is going to make me pleased with you. He's saying how you do is going to make me pleased with you. So hear that. He's not saying that if you would have done something better, if you would have offered this sacrifice, if you would have showed up early, he's not saying any of that. He says how you do, what you do is going to make me pleased. But if you do not do well, right, if you forsake who I am and have a relationship with me, if you do not do that, if you don't do it for me, be careful because sin is crouching at the door and it's ready to consume you. And this leads right to what we're going to be talking about because James 1.14 says this, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And see, we see a struggle here. We see Cain, who's built his entire life saying, I can lift the curse, is now being brought to his knees saying, it ain't about you. It's not about you. If you will just do well, if you will just focus on who it's for, if you will just focus on me, then I will please you. I will bless you. I will bless you. And that leads us to our second point. Because when we become captive to sin, we even lose sight of our desire to lift the curse. You see, what you see of Cain in this next part is that he's going to step even further back. And instead of accepting repentance right then and there, he says, no, 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 no. This can't be. How could you do this? Let's look at it together. Verse 8. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother, Abel, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? I want you to see this. Is that Cain comes to a place where he's faced with a decision. Do I heed the words of the Lord? Or do I give in and remain in my desire to sin? Do I remain in my own wants, my own pleasures, my own satisfaction, and say, I'm running my life, let me do it the way I want to do it. And see, when he doesn't get the blessing, he is chosen. Hear me, he is chosen to not surrender. He is chosen to not repent. He is chosen not to be blessed. He does not do well. And what do we see? He meets up with his bro. Hey man, how's it going, right? And then he kills him. Now you might be asking, why in the world would he kill Abel? What did Abel do? Abel's just over there doing what Cain was doing a second ago. Now you gotta remember, Abel's the second born, right? He doesn't have this overwhelming burden of, I have to be the one, right? He just gets to be pleased to offer sacrifices to the Lord in faith. But Cain can't have it. And instead of lashing out to the one he really wanted to do harm to, God, knowing he couldn't do anything really to God, he went after the one who bore God's resemblance. He went after the one who was doing well. There's hatred. He's an enemy with God at this point. He's saying, uh-uh, I'm not living life like that. If you're not pleased with what I'm doing and all that I've done for you, I don't want anything to do with you. And in my hurt, in my anger, I'm going to make you hurt, God. I'm going to make you hurt. And what we see is that this religion, when it's put to the test, it fails. And it deepens our sense of being stuck in this curse. And we go on and on and on. And what we see in the next few passages, in the next few verses, and I won't necessarily read these together, but the summary of that is, is that Cain is banished. Not only just banished from his family, but he's banished from the presence of God. 
And he goes out. But God puts a, a mark on him and says, this person is not going to be harmed. Right? God doesn't want to see the rest of his, of his creation killing other people to try to get this vengeance going. Right? Because we know that never ends. So he says, I'm going to preserve you. You live your life. So what does he do? Well, he knows his wife. He has a wife. And, what, and, when, and, and his wife, or excuse me, his son builds a city. And he names the city after himself. After he takes two wives. So he starts seeing this. His son builds a city, names it after himself. He has another kid later on. And this, one of his last descendants, Lamech, if you read further on, it says that he and his two wives that he has, he starts to boast. And if you look, look, look with me in chapter 4 real quick. But what we see here, verse 23, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I have to say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. Cain's revenge. Hear that. What would be Cain revenging? Shouldn't people be revenging Abel, right? No, no, no. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then mine is going to be seventy-seven. It's multiplying. He's stuck deeper and deeper and deeper in this, in this pit, in this curse. Even to where his descendants, naming cities not after God, not after giving God thanks and glory for giving them the opportunity to build this place, not after following in his decree and how he made a man and a woman one and one, but his other descendants are having two wives, not after learning from the fact that, that we are to guard and preserve the sanctity of life but yet he kills somebody for striking him and boasts about it brags about it you see they've even lost sight of lifting the curse at all see sin crouching at the door what we read in james 1 15 and here's what we see is that then desire when it is conceived gives birth birth to sin and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Now we see his descendants, and they have almost no life that God would inspire and, and ordain them to live. It's almost completely void. No desire at all of lifting a curse and seeking God's approval. Worshiping him is completely gone. And that leads us to our third point. What we see here. We must surrender to the one who became the lifted curse. So that we don't repeat what Cain did. So we don't follow after the serpent's lineage. See in verse 25 and 26 of chapter 4, if you read it with me. We see the story not ending in this chapter. It says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed me for another offspring. Instead of Abel... For Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At the time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. You see, God wasn't going to let Cain and what he did deter from keeping his word. Because he said, I am going, through your offspring, going to crush the head of the serpent. I am going to provide, even though it now seems bleak. And he provides another son. And see, this is the path that God established. Now, I'm going to walk you through some things, and I think it's really cool for us to see, because a little bit further in the future of our Bible here, in the history of our Bible, rather, we see a man named Moses, right? We know Moses. Moses leads people out of, e out of Egypt. They go and they complain, right? They don't have the faith to go into the promised land that's been provided. So what do we see? They complain. They grumble. God Keeps them wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. But he's still providing for them, right? He gives them food. They get water. But they start complaining again, like, oh, I don't want to eat McDonald's every single day of the week. Lord, come on. My kids would love it, by the way. So what do we see? So God sends serpents. And serpents come on the camp. And they start biting people. And people are dying. So they cry out to Moses, Moses, pray to God. He needs to save us. 
These snakes have come into the camp and they're killing us. So he prays to God and God tells him that I want you to build a serpent, a bronze, a bronze serpent. I want you to put this on a pole. I want you to go to the top of the hill and I want you to hold up this serpent. So that way anyone who is bit by a serpent, when they are bit, they could look up on this snake. And if they do that in faith, they will be healed. So you might be asking me, Eric, why in the world are we transitioning from Cain to the serpent? Well, because of this very point. If you look at 2 Corinthians 5.21, it reads, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see that serpent? The snake that was coming was, was an embodiment of their own sin. God sent the snakes to be like, you're complaining. You're not even looking at my provision. You're not looking at your guidance. You are stuck in your own sinfulness. So I'm going to send the snake to remind you. But then not only that, I'm going to provide a snake. And that snake is going to allow you to look inside of yourselves and see what's going on. So that way you can see your salvation. And as we read right there in 2 Corinthians, as we read, it says, he who knew no sin became sin. You might be asking, what does that mean? Why don't you look at John 3 with me? John 3 says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent, this is Jesus speaking, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I want you to see this here. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up on the cross. You see, he became sin. So that way he could die for our sin. So that way the retribution, the righteous wrath of God would be satisfied in his death alone. So that your snake bite, your venom, your sin would no longer be weighing you down, would no longer hold you under this curse, but that the curse itself would be lifted up. Cursed be any man who'd be killed on a tree. Hear me, church. It didn't necessarily just stop there. But as 2 Corinthians reminded us, is that we even receive the righteousness of Jesus. So it's not only that, that he lifts our curse that on that cross, he died and broke the curse of sin on our lives. But he bestows on us righteousness. As if we'd never sinned. Jesus' inheritance gets put on us as spotless, precious children. In closing, if you look back in chapter 4 with me, there's a, there's a verse that we skipped. Genesis 4, verse 10. Right after he said, am I my brother's keeper? I don't know what happened to him. Cain lies to God, which doesn't make sense to me. Here's where we see. Verse 10 says, and the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you're cursed from the ground. Crying out to me from the ground. What does that blood say? I'll tell you what it says. It says, I want justice. Someone has done wrong to me. They have spilled my blood. Justice must be deserved. Hebrews 12, 24 gives us some insight to this, though. It says, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. What is this better word? This word is Freedom. See, Jesus did not demand justice when his blood was spilled on the cross from you and me. He said, forgive them for they know not what they do. He says, it is finished. My blood will take their payment. It will take their wages. I will be the punishment. I will take that on myself. See, God ordained that Jesus would come 
so that way his blood would speak far better than Abel's. The first man that spilled, that had his blood spilled on the ground, demanding for justice, justice was seen when God finally sent his son to crush the head of the serpent and to lift the curse for you and me. So my question is, have you been freed from the curse? Have you been set free from sin, separation, and death? Many of us today are still trying to lift the curse. Like Cain, we have good intentions. We work, we sweat, we attend church, we tithe, we serve. But like Cain, we are earning our way. Placing our faith in what we are capable of doing. Maybe you've heard, if you just pray more, right? If you just read a little bit more. If you have somebody pray over you more. Following that religion, while missing a life, believing in and seeking the person who's the only one who can lift that curse and set us free, will keep us trapped, will keep us stuck. So I ask you, are you willing to embrace the gift to have your curse lifted? Christian, do you need to repent and return to your first love? Oh, you remember when you were first saved? Remember how much of a passion and drive? I had journals. I was just writing what I read, what I thought about it, how thankful I was. Do we need to return to our first love and remember the person who reached into our dead souls, lifted our curse, and gave you a purpose to why we do what we do? If you'll pray with me. Dear Jesus, I come before you today. Father God, I pray that you would be with his people. I pray that your word would speak to our souls. Lord God, if there's anyone in here, anyone online, anyone listening at all, Lord, Lord, who needs to have their curse lifted. God, who's struggling and tired of trying to do it all on their own. They've looked and they've seen hypocrisy. They've looked and they've seen people fail. Lord God, but it doesn't make them any better. They just want to be free. They just want to be good enough to be satisfied, to have a purpose. Father, allow them, please. Allow them to see your love and your grace. Lord God, I pray that you would call them. They would be children bought with the precious blood of Jesus. Father, if there's anyone in here who are saved, who are Christians, but have been going through the motions, Lord. They have been just walking and journeying, and they have just been so tired lately. They go to church, they, they give, they serve even. But Lord, if they have forgotten who it is that they've done, that they do this for. If they have forgotten that first love, that burning desire just to be with you, to serve you and worship you, I pray that they would have the boldness and the discernment to, to lay down and surrender their sin, surrender their desires, surrender their needs, and they would run to you. Remember what you did on the cross and reconnect with the one who saved their soul. Father, whatever needs to be done today, I pray that that be your will. I pray that you would be with us as we have this time to sing and to worship you some more. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Just stand as we worship. Yeah.
I just want to thank you guys for being here this morning, those who are in person and online. And uh, I want to just uh, say today, uh, we want to thank Eric for speaking this morning and, and come and bring the word to us this morning. But if you've made a decision, we have a connect card in the back of the chair in front of you. And uh, if you want, uh, if you made a decision, if you'd like to know more about the church, if uh, you have just questions uh, or you want to just know information about maybe serving, uh, or if you have a prayer request, we would love to pray for you this week in our staff meeting. We do that each week. And so uh, if you have any questions, find that on the, in the back of your pew in front of you there and uh, fill that out and get that, get that to us. Wanted to give you just a heads up about next Sunday. We talked about grief share. Uh, Pastor Matt has kind of brought that to you, kind of shared his heart about this new ministry that we're, we're beginning. So next Sunday, the 21st at 5 p.m., We'll be kicking that off, that ministry off. And so we want you to register for that. You can do that in person, the sign-ups here today, or you can do that online. And so uh, if you need more information about that, please call us or email us at the at the church. We'd love to follow up with you about that. And then on Monday night, uh, we have our new membership class. And so we're very excited. We haven't done this for about a year. So we're not sure how many people will come for that, but we are welcoming everybody. We want you also to register. You could do that online as well. And so uh, that's next Monday night at 6 p.m. That'll go about an hour. It won't go, be too long. But there we'll be able to share our mission and our visions with you guys. Um, just to, uh, more information about the church, about ministries, uh, some great leadership we have here. And uh, people who are leading ministries will be there as well. So please come next Monday night uh, if, uh, if that uh, pertains to you. So thank you guys again for being here with us this morning. I'd love to close us with a prayer and then we'll be sent. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much just for a great day in worship. Father, just for your spirit as uh, it just flows to this place this morning. Father, we are just praying for those who were kind of shut in this morning. I know a lot of folks are uh, dealing with weather and ice and all that stuff and just don't feel comfortable coming out. So we want to pray for those folks. And Father, we just uh, want to reiterate the prayers just uh, earlier about our kids going back to school and our families that are trying to get back to normal. So we just want to continue to lift those families up, the families in our church and our community, God. Father, we just, uh, we love you so much. We, we praise you just for being a God who uh, always loves us and is always steadfast and faithful. Uh, Father, we just thank you so much for today, for the time we've had just to worship you, God. So uh, be with us this, this time and as we leave and as we uh, go throughout our work week, Father. We pray for the weather and all the things that are going to happen this week, but we just pray for your safety. We pray that you just wrap your arms around us, God, and uh, we just love you and thank you and we praise you. It's in your most grace, gracious name we pray. Amen. Guys, you were safe.